Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Big Blend Radio's Quality of Life show with Nancy and Lisa. You know us, the crazy mother-daughter travel team as we travel across the country documenting parks and public lands while also hosting our Big Blend Radio shows and also publishing our different Big Blend magazines, one of them being Quality of Life magazine. And that brings us to our guest today. We're very excited to welcome oncology and hospice nurse and author Therese Brown to the show she is the author of Critical Care and also the 2015 New York Times bestseller, The Shift, One Nurse, 12 Hours, Four Patients' Lives. And she is also a contributor to the New York Times opinion pages, CNN.com, and the American Journal of Nursing. And she has a new book out. It just came out. It's her new memoir. It's called Healing, When a Nurse Becomes a Patient, and you can go to her website, TeresaBrownRN.com, and that's Teresa with an H in there, uh, TeresaBrownRN.com, she's on Twitter, social media as well, Um, but, you know, going through this, it's almost, to me, like a um, follow-up from her bestseller, The Shift, reading this, and this is her own personal story, so welcome to the show, Teresa, how are you? I'm good, and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're really glad to have you on this show. Mm -hmm. I think there's not one person in the world that is not touched by cancer in some way. Um, You know, Nancy and I did a tour in South Africa with Nancy and her artwork, raising funds for the National Cancer Association. So we kind of, we met so many different people. people, Oh, yeah. Wow. And, And as a kid, we went to, you know, we went to hospital, like hospice centers and cancer wards, and I got to meet kids, um, that, you know, we're losing their hair and I had my hair. And then I'm like, God, do you want my hair? You know, as yeah, a kid, you know, these, <laughs> you know, it sounds terrible, but it's true. As a kid, you're like, oh, like, holy crap, this stuff happens to my age, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's really interesting for you going through this um, on your side, you know, go, reading your book and getting involved. In, it's like, like, you know, all what happens with cancer, but then suddenly it's on you and you had to have that whole role reversal. It does kind of feel like it could be the follow up to the shift, right? Writing your it, memoir. It does. Yeah. You're the first person who said that, but I, I think that was somewhere in the back of my brain. So yeah, you're right. It does feel like a follow up and I, and getting to that point about losing your hair. Mm-hmm. That was so much what motivated me to write healing was realizing that as a nurse, I never really understood how patients felt about these, felt about these side effects, losing their hair, having Mm. to go home with an intravenous line hanging out of their body. We always said, well, we're saving their life. Who cares if you lose your hair? We're saving your life. You know, who cares Mm. if the chemo made it so you have such bad neuropathy in your feet, you can barely walk. We saved your life. And then when I became a patient, I learned how important all that stuff is because it's your hair and your Mm -hmm. feet and they matter too. They don't matter more than one's life, but they matter. Mm. Yeah. It's about the quality of your life. And and I don't know, to me, um, hospitals are terrifying. You know, I spent a lot of time, not because I was sick because my dad was sick practically grew up in LA General Hospital and I don't know you know we terrorize my brother and I terrorize the hospital because nobody <laughs> really was disciplining us at at that point and um, we did a lot of things we shouldn't have done but now when I walk that there's that smell as soon as I smell mm. that smell I'm like I'm the worst patient ever <laughs> <laughs> the worst I'm the biggest baby I pass out even. I just pass out. It's quicker. Oh, well, but let me reframe that for you because (laughs) what I discovered as a patient is from having been a nurse, I had this idea of the ideal patient. And there's a chapter in healing called the ideal patient, which is ironic Mm -hmm. because I came in for my two biopsies. So my cancer was diagnosed on an ultrasound as part of a mammogram but a scan can never tell you hundred percent that you have cancer. They have to actually look at the tissue, which mm. that's another euphemism. They have to look at part of your body. Mm. So they have to get that part of your body out of your body 
and actually look at the cells to determine whether you have cancer. So a biopsy is the way they get that tissue. And I needed two different kinds of biopsies. So I went in and, okay, I'm going to be the easy patient, right? And I'm going to not move when they tell me not to move. And I'm going to move when they tell me to move. And I'm going to lean back a quarter inch and I'm going to do all this stuff. And by the end of the time getting those two biopsies, I realized the incredible cost there was to me of being the person who wouldn't complain, who did everything they asked. Both biopsies, they complimented me afterwards on my superhuman patients, which meant a tremendous amount to me, I'm embarrassed to say. Hmm. But I wish I'd been more like you, like, I'm a baby. I can't sit here like this. I can't do this, you know? (laughs) Um, and yes. leave me alone. <laughs> there needs to be space in the system, not for us to be babies. I was joking, mm-hmm. but to be human, to have our worries, to have our fears. And again, what got me to write the book is that lack of accommodation in the healthcare system for what people are going through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think there's almost like, um, in the, you know, like somebody in the middle, you know, that, that is like the human care, like the TLC person and mm-hmm. also explaining what's going on because That's things go sense. crazy in your mind. When I had surgery on my arm, they were putting a rod in my arm and it was a, an, a, you know, an emergency thing. And um, next thing I know I'm having surgery and I am like, Nancy thinks she's a baby, but like, now I'm like way worse. I'm her daughter. I'm going to make it even better. You know, (laughs) like if she's scared, I'm really going to be a baby. And my thing was, I'm scared of anesthesia. You're going to put me under what happens if I wake up during the surgery. Mm. That is something, I don't know who doesn't think about that. And, you know, you've, you, and watch stupid movies that you should never watch. (laughs) But this next thing I know, and all I wanted to know is, is there a code word? do I do something to tell Mm. the doctors, Hey, I'm awake. And they wouldn't answer me and they rolled me in and next thing I know I was out. So that was good. But the absolute sheer paranoia blew my mind. And then having to go after that, I couldn't move my arm and having to go to the bathroom on my own. Well, I only want to do on my own. And I had a male nurse and they kept in, started pushing on my bladder and stuff. (gasps) And I'm like, I'm not going. I freaked out, like literally freaked out because and the nurses were fine, but it was a, there was a paranoia that can really set in. Mm-hmm. That isn't, and I can only imagine when you find out you have cancer, now all this rush, that's a paranoia. Like that's like, that's a holy crap moment, you know? Yeah, definitely. I'm having so many thoughts listen to you, listening to you because I identify so much with mm. all those feelings. And and again, this biopsy that I had, it's it's a very weird procedure called a stereotactic biopsy, where they have you lie on a table that has a hole in it, and you put your breast Mm. through the hole, and then they raise you up in the air like a car in a garage. Wow. Um, And then they're doing these things to try and get the sample, and they never told me, okay, now we're trying, oh, now we're trying again, now we're trying again. Mm. I just... I don't understand why you would, okay, now we're going to be, you know, it's not like there's, they were sticking in a knife or something every single time, but there was a little bit of pain Mm. each time and no one was preparing me for that. You know, I think my own personal theory is you're so scared that you contract all your muscles. So anything they do is going to hurt because you can't relax. Right. Well, that's the the joke, right? When you're getting your pelvic exam and the doctor says, relax. And (laughs) there's no way. Right. Get your hands off me. (laughs) Yeah. And and don't wear the white coat. I want, I I want to do like a change.org petition for all doctors to take their white jackets and tie dye them into like hippie or batik or something. (laughs) I'm tired of the white coat because there is a syndrome. And I think this is what's so interesting about your writing is that you are bridging that gap, which is, there is definitely a gap yet. I think, you know, as nurses, you know, what you've done in the past and, and continue to do, you're still that soul that is helping someone. You are that bridge, but being a patient, you understand so much more now, but the Mm. whole system is out of whack. I think our, 
like in other countries, you know, like when we were in Mexico, my step grandfather had a stroke. We think because mm-hmm. I still We're say still we think sure. because of the language barrier, mm-hmm. but they expected my grandmother to stay overnight with him in the hospital. In this country, it's kind of in and out about that. You know, people do stay there, but it's not like expected. Yeah, you know, and it's not part of the culture. Right. You know what I mean? It's yeah, right. And when we had to leave her at the hospital, she was she went into she shock. freaked she, out. She didn't want to stay. She's like, uh, uh-uh. uh. <laughs> Bye. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's even, I mean, for the for the follow-up scan uh, where my tumor was found, I, I had gone by myself. So mm. that's on me. Mm. But, yeah. but even now, I always have someone come with me, but that yeah. person can't come back into where I'm getting the scan with me. Yeah. So you're on your own. And then yeah. after I had the scan where they were pretty sure I had cancer and I, I did have cancer, they needed another mammogram. So they put me back out in the hallway where I had waited, where all these other women were waiting. And I'm sitting there as tears streak down mm. my face yeah, and feeling guilty because I know I'm making every woman who sees me anxious and I thought, oh God, yeah. And, and the story is, is in the book. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there a room they could have put me? Wasn't there a different yes. a there cozy should, room? There should be like, when we went to get our um, injections for the pandemic the vaccine. Yeah. First one. Yeah. It, 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 we went to Safeway and they had yep. a little cozy room that was warm mm-hmm. and friendly and this nice lady right came in and we told her, you know, I, I just pass out because don't even show me the needle because I'm done. <laughs> I'm really bad. And she came in and she's rubbed my shoulder and she talked. And then all of a sudden it was over. And mm-hmm. I didn't pass out one of the few times because the room was cozy and it had flowers and it was pretty. Just a little nice. Nancy is not doing the Walmart in public shot oh, no <laughs> that's not happening no but, way but this but this but this is that that thing because you don't want to freak out everybody else either you have to yeah. have that brave like for me by the time nancy got her shot my arms were all pumped up and like <laughs> i'm all freaked out for her so mine didn't feel that great i'm just saying oh, but this well, so, I, I understand but good, this is but... cancer where this is you're looking at all sides Mm. So you have every emotion going through you. Well, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That is so hard to deal with. I'm glad you're writing it down because I also believe by what you're doing in writing is you're addressing fear, mm-hmm. comfort, mm. understanding, and we do need to make changes in the system. Yes, we do. But also how many people don't go to get mammograms, et cetera, because of that fear. And because of the way the system is. So how many people don't get their lives saved because of it? Yeah. Wow, that is a great question. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I, in healing, I do go into what we call now health disparities, but basically that Black Americans, mm-hmm. Latino Americans have much worse outcomes for cancer, mm-hmm. all cancers than white Americans. Right, so you've got race in the mix. I Mm -hmm. know that people who are from the LGBTQ community for the exact same reasons, they don't want that general indifference and lack of compassion. And then maybe also hostility because they're Mm -hmm. perceived as being different in a way Mm -hmm. that whoever's taking care of them isn't comfortable with. But yeah, I'm sure there are people who just don't go because... Mm. They don't want to deal with it. And in fact, well, also de- depending on the states, I mean, there was an era of like bad things happening to women in mm. clinics. I just, the whole, um, just we're going to take out your reproductive organs. We're going to teach, you know, we're going to do all these tests on you. I think that kind of thing doesn't leave a generation. It does pass on to the next generation, that fear. So I know in, in certain states like Mississippi, you know, black women lost the rights of their body, basically going in. So yeah. I yeah. wonder about like, I'm not going in 
to a doctor if they're going to do that. And you have, there's a trust. Mm -hmm. What did you say that goes with all of this? Yes, absolutely. And for me, that trust broke down almost right at the start. I had this scary scan where the radiologist said, I see a mass. I waited Mm -hmm. uh, quietly crying in the hallway, got another mammogram. Radiologist showed me the imaging, talked to me, was wonderful and said, you won't leave here without an appointment for a biopsy so they can get that sample, right? So, okay, great go to sit down where I'm supposed to wait to schedule a biopsy and no one came by, no one came by. And I'm sure I looked like I was having the worst day of my life, which I was. Mm. Finally, a receptionist walked by and said, oh, she leaves at three. You just missed Mm. her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I got so angry. I am not a violent person, but I wanted to hurt that person. (laughs) Right. Um, And yeah, it just completely broke down any sense I had that, oh, there's someone here, some aspect of the system that cares about me, that can hold this experience for me and shepherd me through it. Instead, Mm -hmm. it all felt like DIY cancer cares and do it yourself. And I I wonder if I hadn't been the kind of person who would have called back the next morning. And then she offered me an appointment two weeks away. And I said, Mm -hmm. no, but we talk in healthcare about people being quote lost to follow up, you know, that, yeah. that could yeah. have been me just, it's I'm not huge. going back. Yeah. It's huge. And you're sick. See, here's right. the other thing. It's you're like, not and depending on you. the disease, right? Yeah. You've got, I mean, it's like your family, how many people are like living solo and don't really have their family around them, depending on circumstance or friends, like you need to have like that support group of people to help you through it because now you're dealing with insurance and then the, the, yeah. You know, go to the hospital and the hospital has to deal with the insurance and then they're questioning you and expecting the patient to understand everything when they're not feeling well. You know what I mean? You're, you're right. worse. I mean, it's like, I just want to say everybody who knows anybody's going through a major toothache, they're not human at that level. <laughs> and if Watch you're going to try and talk sense, that's not cool. And so it's a really, it's an emotional mm thing depending on your illness too you know right and Mm -mm. right and that's what I didn't realize as a nurse I was taking care of leukemia patients very sick Um, people who a lot of them routine blood work maybe they'd been a little bit they would get a call saying you need to go to the hospital right now because you have a disease that can kill you and all of a sudden they're in the hospital for two months And those people must have been terrified because I was terrified. Mm -hmm. And yet as a nurse, I didn't see that. And the reality is you can't show up to work a hundred percent empathizing with that, right? Oh, you're, you'll burn out, but there Mm -hmm. needs to be more awareness of how patients are feeling. And I, I love, I love you saying that I'm the bridge. I think that's lovely. I would, I would love to be the bridge. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, so. it's, I think it's really important what you've written because I know I remember from my dad that my dad at home was a miserable son of a whatever. And he was, <laughs> well, he couldn't breathe most of the time. So, right. you know, he, really, he was, yeah, he had a very short fuse and he just, he was mean in wow. the hospital. When we went to visit him, my brother and I, um, we were the, the ones who, we're old enough to actually go and visit. There were hmm. other kids at home, and then there was an older one who didn't care. Um, we would go in and visit him, and here he was joking with everybody, flirting with the nurses, Mr. La 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 personality. At home, he's meaner than heck. You know, we're like, what are you giving him? We want some. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> because he had a total personality change. And I'm after reading your book, I'm thinking, oh, I see. He saw be the easy patient and you'll mm. be taken care of. Don't be the nasty one because somebody's going to pay you back. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, and yeah. also just as you maybe in the hospital, he could also breathe better. And so he could think better and he could respond better. And because he was actually 
getting physical relief, but yeah, mm-hmm. I'm right. Clearly he had understood, Oh, be charming and yes. people will take better care of you. Exactly. Now I see you know, it. I did not have to phrase it before I read your book. Now I'm like, Oh, yeah. I see what you did. Smart little dude. <laughs> but well, I, was, I think that the emotions are so big. Like, you know, just even the very beginning when you're talking about, you know, going through okay you've got the mass and you're already like you know oh god i know when they're slowing down you know what's going on and the emotions that go in there it's like there is anger i had a friend who was diagnosed she had a brain tumor and it was cancerous and the sweetest lady watches her diet healthy i mean you know the perfect you know bill of health well that didn't apparently work on that and um this happens and her and her wife went to the restaurant and she's like, I'm going here and I'm eating what I want to eat right now. And she sat in the restaurant and said every curse word that you can imagine, like coming out of her sweet Mm -hmm. petite person, (laughs) every curse word. And her her wife sat there like, okay, go get it out because, and she's like, I'm going to eat this. I'm going to like, and she I'm going to eat this and I'm going to swear this and I'm going to say this. And she did. And then she, she had to get a hold of it in some way and just say, well, you know, here's my whole life fighting this, knowing that there's this possibility because of genetics. And you talk about that with your family too, that when you know it's in your family, you kind of try to behave and try and do things. And then here it is. Mm. And you're like, damn you. <laughs> you yeah, know? I tried not to. I did everything they told me not to do, like to do, to not get it. And here you are. You know, you just it. There's a silent rage that happens. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. not so silent with my friend because I think the restaurant hurt her. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's that's a really important. Also, another reframing because. I don't like it when people say, oh, cancer ended up being a gift because I figured out that I value X, Y, and Z about life. It's it's not the cancer. It's someone's been living their life, right? Following certain rules, thinking this is going to keep me healthy. And, and then you get a cancer diagnosis and it's so disruptive to your whole sense of order and organization and that the universe is fair and things can come out of that that can be really positive, but it doesn't mean that the disease gets credit for that. It means patients get credit for making something of that experience. So um, maybe I'll just go to a restaurant tonight and swear a lot, you know, <laughs> this so. to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then eat five desserts for my dinner, you know, <laughs> exactly. I want to do that without cancer even. <laughs> <laughs> just for the part of it <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah i mean i think this is also important because they're saying that basically we're all born with cancer well, it's how our bodies what's going on and and the environment and the you know all these things but we're all in some way born with cancer which is a fear factor like that's a fear hmm. factor so it's kind of like okay we're all going to go through something at some point you know, whether it's through age or it's going to happen now, you know, so I think it's fear and then fear of going the medical situation, because when, oh, when you're in doctor's care, nurses care, sorry, but it's true. Once you're in everyone's care, you have almost, you've basically said, I'm not in control of my body. Exactly. Anymore. Right. And, and that's, that's scary. Right. scary. That's right. scary. That's really the scary part. When when I was a kid, I had nephritis, so it's home in bed for a year. While I was, while they were diagnosing, trying to figure out what's wrong, I used to go to the doctor's office, and the nurse would take my blood, and it wasn't comfortable, but mm. it, it didn't hurt. When the doctor, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., he'd come into our home and jab me six times before he could find a vein. That's where I taught myself to faint. And I got so good at it. I fainted when I heard his car go up the driveway. I'm done. And wow. don't wake me up until it's over. Because he kept jabbing and he'd do both arms. I'm like, oh, my God. Stop it. 
Wow, that's terrible. That's I, learned, I learned that nurses can do stuff that doctors can't. <laughs> that's true. It's true. Yes. Yeah. It's called practice. No, nurses. <laughs> nurses are godsends. I don't know anybody who could go through a medical situation in a doctor's office or in the hospital or urgent care without having a nurse that just there's this, you know, I know you want to bridge the gap further, which is absolutely important and necessary. But if there wasn't nurses, we'd, we'd all be, we wouldn't, I go. don't know. We'd all, we'd all <laughs> be crazy. Like we go would. All. Yeah. We'd be crazy. You know what I mean? It just is, you guys do so much to relieve and, just the little things, but at the same, I mean, just those little things help. I mean, wouldn't you say mm-hmm. just even on your experience that even, yeah, fluff a pillow, that means something. Just right. that, how are you? It's like, because you become non-human when you go through this. Yes. It's that weird battle. Yeah. And that's why I wrote about where I got radiation oncology because they actually made it better. And it was in the very same hospital where the receptionist wasn't there to schedule my biopsy, but somebody in that center had decided we are going to make patients feel like people. So they were very clear about the expectations. They showed me a video of what radiation treatment is like. Mm -hmm. And the technicians were unfailingly kind, polite, friendly. I saw them five days a week for four weeks at 11 o'clock. And it was always, hi, Teresa, how are you? Uh you know, they were just wonderful because somebody had decided that was going to be a priority for that office. Mm -hmm. And so that's the question I ask if they can do it at radiation oncology, why can't they do it everywhere else? Yeah. See that individual and because it's a relationship, it's like from the patient's perspective, don't you feel like you're going into this battle and they're part of your, your, your soldiers, they're your crew. Yeah, to, right. To, yeah. My posse. So, yeah. And, and, yeah, and there, you, there's a relationship that has to happen. So, and, and, it's so personal. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you're having to get mm-hmm. undressed. That sucks. Mm-hmm. That really sucks. Oh, man, and your butt crack and, always and, shows. Yeah, why can't things? the hospital <laughs> gowns close? Yeah. Why do <laughs> we have to have the butt showing? This is off and on when I give talks, I, I say, I just want some fashion designer to be listening yeah. and I want them to design a better hospital gown. One that is really? not so hideously ugly and closes. Yes. And closes. Oh. I can't, you know, before you, before you, I know. And I also want doctors to stop with the white jacket. Just stop it. it we want one thing. Um, Puppy dogs, so listen, I want to tell you flowers. with us, traveling full-time I have to tell you that nurse's gear is the best travel gear on the planet oh wow <laughs> you, we, I'm wearing nurse's pants right now. well we pets it too because it's a really good way to travel and and just do what we do Thank you about this about your dog and you because mm-hmm. this is something we, we you know we do a heart health segment every month and we you know we really talk about I want to do this thing about how dogs help our human health Mm -hmm. and how did your dog help you? Because, you know, I've, I know from pet petting dogs will get us off our butts, get us to take them Mm -hmm. for a walk, have curiosity. And like, if they, they have a routine. So how Mm -hmm. did that help you? How did your dog help you? Yeah. Well, she was wonderful because I picked a surgeon and an oncologist who I knew were very smart and technically really good, but were not warm and fuzzy. And then mm. once I was further along in my treatment, I, I wanted some warm and fuzzy. I felt like I really needed that. And mm. so my dog was my warm and fuzzy. And sometimes after going to radiation treatment, I rode my bike, I'd run my bike three miles there, ride my bike home and occasionally wow. take a, yeah, a little afternoon mm. nap. And she would come and sleep on top of me. And it, oh, wow. Yeah, it felt so healing. She's about 40 pounds. Um, It just was wonderful. It was, it was what I needed. And I didn't get it from the doctors, but I got it from my dog. Yeah, but see, pets know. 
Yeah. But, but, you know, on the other side, the nurses and doctors don't know you personally. They see more of you than they should, but they don't really know you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that also helps. Bridge. <laughs> that actually in some ways helps for you to go through a situation that you're not comfortable with. Because you can go into a different persona. Like in a, even well, though it's you, it's a different do. persona. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. You know what I mean? It's like, this is not me. This is a temporary state mm. kind of feeling. You have to put your I don't know how to explain it other it. than that. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's like, if you're going to see my butt, you're going to see it now, you know, and you're not going to know me later, hopefully. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? It's, you know, because you know, the day of the family doctor, I guess is gone. I don't know. Yeah, but sometimes I think you know, when you have a family doctor that that you actually are friends with and you know and you can wave to them and mm-hmm. when you see them walking down the street if they walk um, instead of drive. But I think that's kind of gone. It's kind of left the mm-hmm. building, which is too bad because mm-hmm. I think that family doctors that know who you are and know your history mm-hmm. are valuable. It's true. Mm-hmm. I, I also think our priorities in healthcare have gotten too much to be about making money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people Mm -hmm. in the C-suite, they could decide, Hey, we're really going to have a a compassion initiative. And of course, once you call it that it's, it's probably ruined. Right. But they could really Mm -hmm. focus on that for everyone and say, this is really a a priority. And instead the pressure people get is about, Billing, paperwork, regulatory requirements. It's it's almost like what happens with patients is just a means to the end of checking some box or other, right? And mm-hmm. patients are all in this kind of healthcare assembly line. But we could have a reorientation of priorities that say, hey, let's focus on our people. US News and World Report is part of their rankings could ask patients about that. Did you feel your care was empathic? Did you feel like people saw you as a human being? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they say, would you come back to this hospital? But that's, that's too vague a question. Yeah. They need to ask, yeah. You know, were you seen? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I think it is about the human part. I I love, I'm so, this is, so big what you've done and I know the book's mm-hmm. just come out but I think you know I know you speak and, and I I just number one thank you for speaking mm-hmm. for all these years and writing for all these oh, years because you. it really means a lot to have someone from the other side talk mm-hmm. with us the patients you know um, because we need to have more like yeah I'm going to keep saying the bridge because that bridge is crucial and you, it's it's a bridge that is about the system itself. As a nurse, I know you care. Uh, doctors, I know, care. But doctors, nurses are super. Look what happened during the pandemic. God, right? I, I mean, the I mean, you've got to think it's traumatic for your side, and it's traumatic for the patient side. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of even like police officers and mm. military. Like, I feel there needs to be compassion on both sides, not just the patient, but on both sides, because Mm -hmm. you're carrying that, too. Mm -hmm. So it's traumatic all the way around. So we need that to go from we need more conversation, discussion, solutions. But Mm -hmm. things can't wait around to be implemented because disease isn't going away and neither are pandemics. So, you know, we need more of that. And maybe through compassion, fear will subside and lifestyle choices will be better and people will get more checkups, you know, that kind of thing. So I just, what you've done is so crucial. And mm-hmm. I, I hope this story continues. And I hope you do. I was looking on your website today. I know you do speaking, but you have uh, guides on there. Are you planning to do, you know, book tours with this and having group discussions, book club groups, that kind of thing? Because I really, really hope you do. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I am giving talks, but also I'm offering myself to book groups or people who just want to talk about healthcare. I will zoom in and um, I've even got some book plates my publisher made that I will sign and send to people because I would like to keep this conversation going too. And I think there's a lot of people who have their own healthcare stories and concerns. Mm-hmm. And you're right, not just patients, but also clinicians who are really struggling right now. <clears throat> so I would like, yes, for all of us to keep talking about this. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I love that. So, so thank you. Okay. Well, One that's real quickie. I just, this is a stupid question, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> do you watch any of the doctor programs like the soap operas and stuff? <laughs> that is not a stupid question. There are no stupid questions. I actually believe that. Um, I, I, I don't. I do occasionally watch Grey's Anatomy because yeah. one of my daughters really likes it, but then I get so irritated at how yeah. unrealistic <laughs> it is. Okay. And, yeah. and finally she says, Mom, you can't watch. So <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but that's really funny because every doctor and lawyer that comes yeah. on our show, we Nancy yeah. brings that up and they n- not one no. says any of it is true. Firefighters, yeah. all of it. All of it. Policemen, no, no. none of it's true. <laughs> Military, uh, no. Nah. Right. No. Okay, right. TV yeah. people, can you get it right? Come on. Let's tell yeah. the truth for once. Well, that's what I say about <laughs> Grey's Anatomy, where doctors do everything right. Like, why on that show can't they just have nurse characters doing what nurses do? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah because, it's, because the stress level is so high, mm-hmm. I think. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's just not, you're dealing with human emotion and humans. This is worse than checking people into a hotel or dealing with them in a restaurant situation or customer support. Mm. You know, this is their body and they're already in fear load or they're like, I'm so used to this. I'm tuning you out. Right. (laughs) You know, right. I'm just always checking in. Here's my arm. Screw you. Just do whatever. I'm I'm (laughs) checking out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's it. I'm checking out because that's their way of dealing with it. And so then again, no connectivity, no, I mean, I I think people have to do what they have to do, but, um, I think so. there was was a time when almost all the soap operas were doctor shows and there was, um, Dr. Kildare. Then there was Mm. whatever the other dude, Ben Casey, there were all these doctor shows for so many years all these these doctor shows and so i'm so thinking, well why why are there so many doctor shows now mm. now there doesn't seem to be so many gray's anatomy is one i don't know if there's chicago med come on yeah, yeah right, the resident yeah. so yeah, i mean I... obviously people are it's a it's a topic of interest mm-hmm mm-hmm it's important, yeah. but what yeah. you see on TV and what happens when you go to the hospital, it ain't the same. And people exactly. don't understand also the doctor's lives. It's like you used to be, go marry yourself a doctor. <laughs> well, do you know how much doctors go through and like how expensive it is to have your own practice? Like in all the insurance and all, like mm-hmm. I think our whole medical care system needs an upheaval, including price yeah. of medication and all the pricing. Mm-hmm. And I don't. It's so much, yeah. but I think compassion is first and foremost. I really do. And, and I think you've really brought that through in, in your writing. Yes. And um, I'm just really glad you started doing it and you're continuing to do it. And we wish you good health moving forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone. Uh, you've got to go get the book, Teresa Brown. And uh, you can go to her website, TeresaBrownRN.com. That's Teresa with an H. And the book, again, is Healing. When a nurse becomes a patient, it is out now. Go get it on your favorite place. But there's also, you've got all of them listed on your site too, including bookshop.org. So like Mm -hmm. that helps support your local bookstores, which is a great place to host a book, you know, bookshop, you know, gathering, just saying. No, great. Okay. (laughs) This conversation (laughs) needs to happen everywhere. So anyway, TeresaBrownRN.com and keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com. Thank you so much, Teresa. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, likewise. You're welcome.